And yeah, I've used it for overlay, so it works out okay And with that. my camera switcher. So, for example, let's see this camera. He uses it for more Ks than Preto. That's what he uses it for. I have used it for that. It's always being streamed. Let's see, where is this camera? There we go. Oh, that's not working. Oh, there we go. So this is uh, this is a a USB. All my video goes through uh, an ATEM, but this is a USB camera. So all my video goes through the ATEM, comes into OBS as one source or scene, and then uh, beautiful day in the bay. Obviously, I was about I to can, say, is that is that what it looks like out of your window? Yes, it does. Just to my right. It's a nice view. Uh, so it's it's uh, it's my ME1. My my ATEM is ME2, which cascades down into ME1. No, other way around. It's my ME2. My ATEM is ME1. It cascades down into ME ME2, and that goes out to broadcast. So anything that can't go into the ATEM goes into that, including, you know my screen captures. So they go through OBS because I'm taking a 5K display and scaling it down to 1080. Instead of saying, well, I want to share this 1080 image, so I'm going to, I want to share a desktop, I can only share a 1080 image, so I'm going to change the resolution of my desktop to 1080, which means I have to suffer Ooh. looking no, at 1080 all day good. long. Right. But, but doing, much easier to read that way, though, right? Every word is but, like three times the size. But taking a 1080 display or a, a, a 5K display and scaling it in OBS, OBS, uh, and then putting it on my stream deck. Yeah, you don't want your monitor to go big, right? Yeah, I, I prefer it in the squinty mode. I like that. I'm going to adopt that, Chris. Now that sounds like a meatloaf album. I'm in squinty mode. We've been using that term for 20 years, ever since the 17 inch displays and the, uh, th and the, uh, remember the 30 inch cinema displays? Oh, Those yeah. were great. I had a 30 inch cinema display. Somebody stole it from me. Somebody uh, stole it? Don't they, those weighed like 50 pounds. I know. I had my uh, G, what what model? No, it was my Mac Pro, the big the, the silver, the first one that came out. I had that and the cinema display temporarily parked in, in the garage because I was going to be moving it. And somehow we left the door open one day and we came home and it was gone. I, you know, I wasn't oh, really using it. So it, it wasn't that it was stolen. You gave it to an unknowing Person, is yeah, you, you could say okay. that if if you consider the that's a bit more accurate the line Officer where the door Fenwick. closes in the so, garage, uh, not your property, <laughs> and an implied for taking sign to be there because it's open. Yes, in those conditions, I did give it away. I hadn't used it in about a year at that point because I had moved into the laptop only world and it was working beautifully for me. Hey, Bill, have you ever used? Um Ryan Wellborn's awesome iPhone plugin, this one. And don't forget to join us on social. No, but that looks nice. Is it, is, so it's a graphics like. Uh, so what he's what he did is he is he modeled iPhones, oh, MacBook nice. Pros and iPads as 3D things by making a font that is every surface of the phone. So it's it's all done in the 3D font generator tool in Final Cut. And then there's a very simple process of mapping stuff to the surface. Chris, stand by. We have a thing. Um, for... I'm hanging up. I'm oh, there she mic. is. Oh, no, no. Good. Liberty just hadn't gotten back, and I wanted to make sure I didn't have to open the show. Sorry about that. Greetings and welcome to Office Hours. If you are new here and you want to learn a little bit more about what we do, head over to officehours.global. Now, our first hour, we answer your questions on media and digital productions. 
And our second hour is something that we typically want to spend a little bit more time on. And today we'll be speaking with art director and content creator Rob Garrett as he talks to us about his process and experience building out quality online training. Well, it's about that time to get into questions. Let's go. It is Liberty. Our first one comes from Samuel Nordvik in Norway this morning. And Samuel says, what kind of interference can an Ethernet cable running alongside a power cable cause? Can it be similar to Wi-Fi dropouts? John? Unlikely. A twisted pair was designed specifically to reject EMF external. That's the reason why those pairs are twisted. So it cancels out any extraneous. And then, you know, on Cat3, which had no, you know, it was not designed for higher speeds. It was designed for 10 meg. But the newer stuff now is is fantastic. And they've got shielding and double shielding on, on 7 and 8. And so, no, they're, they're designed to be super resilient against any uh, extraneous EMF. Jason? So the rule is you can't go above gigabit for any less than uh, CAT 6. CAT 7 was only adopted mostly in Europe. Um, CAT 8 is pretty much immune to everything because, as John said, the way that it is, uh, the way that it's insulated and, and wound. So but long story short, as long as you don't have CAT 5, you'll probably be good. And Courtney? Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. It's it's pretty immune to uh, normal AC cable stuff. Now, if you're running it on a, on a set or something with some uh, high voltage HMI cables from the ballast to the my, to the light head, where you've got high frequency square waves going through those cables, uh, that can <clears throat> interfere and cause some packet loss, uh, especially if you're, you're talking about higher higher speed uh, Ethernet uh, connections. You know, one gig to ten gig. Next question. Next one comes to us from Douglas Carmichael. For non-audio for video projects, should, should we be working at 48 kilohertz or 44.1 kilohertz? Go ahead, Courtney. I would work at 48 or 96 if you're doing just an audio project. Um, no sense in starting at 44.1. If you're going to end up at 44.1, you may want to you know, go somewhere else with your audio other than the CD format. You may want to you know, publish a... a uh, High quality 96 kilohertz sample rate, and you'd have to upsample if you recorded at 44.1. And so it's probably better to downsample than to upsample. And Bill? You got it perfect for non audio for video projects. Yeah, I would always be at 48 kilohertz. That's the DV, the digital video standard, has been there forever, and anything video oriented should be at that. I will say, I was shocked that uh, I've been doing a little work on audiobook stuff, trying to learn a little bit about that thing. And even the biggest services like ACX, which is Audible's uh, piece of uh, audiobook, they prefer, in fact, they demand 44.1. So it's still alive in some pretty big industries out there. But overall, 48 is safer and you can always downsample. And Alex. Yeah. And a lot of the things that are audio only and not video, I often do at 96. <laughs> so, so it's, uh, you know, to have more a little more headroom there. So the, um, the, but 48 is definitely the safe one. And, and if you need to deliver to 44, one, it's a delivery format. So just convert to 44, one, but don't, don't, don't work. Friends don't let friends work in 44, one. Sounds like a t-shirt. <laughs> next question. Uh, next question comes from Ian Alford in London. How is preparation going for office hours at NAB? Alex? I think it's going pretty well. We, we're we meeting every Monday and, and we have, um, I think that the, Brian sent me the, the stats. I don't have them right in front of me, but I think we have 51 volunteers. Uh, I think that there are uh, 36 from 10 countries and 15 on site. <laughs> so, so it's going to be busy. Uh, we do have a live view in. We're working on some licensing issues, but we have one of the live views in. Jeff Keithley's bringing another one. So we'll have at least at least two of them there for a couple of the days. Um, and uh, we have a, a growing number of people like, hey, do you want to broadcast this? So, so we have a lot of people lining up for that. So I, I do think that it's going to be pretty interesting. We may do some tests from NAM. Um, so uh, stay tuned for that. There may be a couple hours of streaming that we do just as a, as a signal test to make sure that everything's working. Um, uh, and NAM is, of course, happening uh, on, in L.A., um, but uh, we have a couple people there, so we're gonna we're gonna see if we can't do a couple hits from Nam to see if everything's working the way we expect it to. Uh, but we do expect it to be a very busy, very 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 busy 
a couple of days. So um, we're pretty excited about it and we'll see what sticks. Some of it will work, some of it won't work. <laughs> some of it will be a little rocky. Uh, what, you know, the thing I'm, I'm really excited about is for the 15 people there and the many people in office hours that are there that aren't necessarily on the team, the after hours, I think, is going to be really interesting where we have people just saying, I'm here, I'm going to show you something cool uh, and and showing that to people. And I think that's going to be a really fascinating um, part of the, what we're doing. But all of it between the shorts, the the VODs, the the live with the panel, the live without the panel, all of it's going to be, uh, be interesting. So stay tuned. So for the people who might pop up and come into after hours, well, is I guess there's not really a schedule. It's just like, hey, we're at this booth and it's really cool yeah. and we'll share it with. What's, what does that look like? Eventually, we'll, the next time we'll probably organize it. The next conference that we cover will most likely be Cinegear. And, and so that'll be the next one that we kind of pay attention to. So we'll take what we what we learned about this one. Uh, you know, we... I, we are very organic. So it's just like, let's figure this, let's do something and see what happens. But what's going to happen is there's a, we're going to create a breakout room from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. And folks that are, that are there who have a cell phone and we get a good connection can just jump into after hours and raise their digital hand and say, I have something I want to show everybody. And we'll see how, whether that gets really crowded or not. Um, my guess is there'll be sometimes when there's four or five hands up and there's sometimes when there's uh, no hands up. <laughs> and so we'll, and eventually what we'll do, I mean, we want to see how it works and I don't want to add too much organization until we see what happens. But the next step will be, you know, we would schedule X number of people to do it. But what's great is it's people who may not necessarily be on the panel or hosts often, but it's a great place for them just to show things that they're seeing. And so I think it can really spread that out and let people practice and give it a shot. So, um, you know, we'll see how that how that looks. Um, but I do think that it's going to be most likely the most in-depth coverage of the conference this year. So I think that, you know, I th whatever we do is going to be pretty interesting. And then it's only going to get better from there. It's just a really great crew that's coming together um, to, to make it happen. Awesome. Next question. Peter Rosado in Las Vegas, Nevada. Panels, thoughts and or feedback on this video breaking down using TVs as, quote, windows. And he's got a link there. Let's start with John. Yeah, so so my windows back here are really a big giant LED wall. No, just kidding. That those are windows. I do have a 55 inch TV back there, and I love the the phony window idea. There's a bunch of cool videos on, on uh, YouTube that I've seen of guys building these giant walls in their basement that really came out really good. But don't get a small screen like mine's only 55, and it's not enough to fill the frame. So you need you need something bigger, but it can really have a nice nice uh, look to it. Courtney, I've seen several videos like this. The one that uh, was mentioned is is really kind of for a set like this, where they're using uh, like three sixty five inch uh, TVs mounted vertically uh, with uh, dividers mullions built into the dividing area between the. You have to find TVs with a very thin mullion around the outside, really. Uh, and the edge, and then you can hide the two mullions behind a piece of wood like that that looks on the right. Uh, a couple of things to consider, though, is if you're going to use them on camera, um, is to light with uh, 5600 or daylight lighting uh, for the rest of your scene. That'll make it a lot easier to color balance the TVs because their natural color balance is 6,000 to 9,000 Kelvin. So uh, on a lot of TVs, uh, and if you try and push them towards the tungsten side, they get real iffy as for their sweet spots, especially if you're mounting them vertically, because a lot of times they're designed so that their sweet spot is set at a certain vertical position when they're mounted horizontally. Your eye level center of the screen is the sweet spot, and you turn them vertically. Then when you move left and right, it's going to color shift as you move left and right a little more. You'll, no you'll notice a little more color shift uh, Make sure you only use IPS displays, and uh, most of most 4K displays are that these days anyway. But it looks interesting, um, you know, especially for those. Uh, I saw one of the guy has a, a basement. He was trying to figure out how to uh, make make his basement livable, and so he set it up as a game playing uh, room and used three vertical mounted uh, uh, LED backed LCDs and uh, set it up similar to the one you saw in the picture there. And uh, it makes you, it gives you a whole new feeling to your basement, opens it up, makes it feel a lot less claustrophobic when you're not playing games on the window. He just puts images of different locations all around the world out there. 
And Alex? Yeah, we did. You can do, we've used screens for a lot of these for a long time and making them look kind of like windows. I mean, I, I don't know if everyone thinks that they're windows, but they are definitely feel like it. When they're out of focus, the way that they show them in this in this video, I think it looks good. There's something about the white point in those, those windows that don't feel like it's quite hitting white. So it feels like something's off. I can't quite figure it, put my finger on it, but it didn't feel like there was enough contrast in the background. Um, one of the things we, we did this, uh, this is, this was years ago at, um, uh, in the EU, the, the, the EU has a, um, has a studio. <laughs> so anyway, so, um, they're the, 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 whatever the, the, in Brussels. And so one of the things we did here is that these are monitors. Um, the monitors that you see here are, I'm going to turn that off. Sorry. You see the monitors in the back there. And then what we did is the circles, the, the circular thing that you see on either side, we had three different YouTubers and we needed to have it, have a different look for each one of them. So what we were able to do is is rotate those between, you know, it was one event that each one of them got like eight or nine, eight or 10 minutes. And, and so we would, um, you know, if you kind of look at the, the setup here, they'd walk over and talk about, um, you know, talk about whatever they're going to talk about. And then they would come back over here. And while they were in the other part of the set, we'd rotate those and change the image. <laughs> so it, was, it gave you a feel like that this one's from Germany and this one's from, you know, and so it was, um, it was a lot of fun, but they do provide a lot of, uh, a lot of flexibility um, to make that actually work. Does anyone know how the trend started? Because I'm glad this question came oh, up. Been, I didn't... The trend has been, I mean, in broadcast, this has been done for <laughs> ever. <laughs> I don't know, for forever. As soon as we had LCDs that were, you could put back there, I think that we started doing it. I mean, I, it, it's been at least, I mean, I think YouTubers are doing it more now. Yeah, but, the YouTubers. But in, for, for what we've been doing, uh, I think that the first one I did was probably 2008 or nine. Um, and those were really expensive because we were using these industrial LCDs and they were, I don't know, they were as much as you'd spend now on, on a TV for the rental, you know, and so, um, for the, for, cause they had to have low buzz, low bezels, you know, so that you can get, you can fit them into the, and back then that was a big deal. So, so anyway, so I, it's been around for a long time. Just YouTubers are now, uh, the part of the thing is, is that the, the price of these monitors has gotten so little you know, has gone so low. It's, that's really what's opened this up is that you can get an 85 inch screen for 1500 bucks. And that, that makes all of this much more doable. That makes sense. Jason? Yeah, they do work in production. I think the first time I used anything that, that I actually wanted to make look like a window instead of, you know, just a background, I want to say it was a 65 or a 75 inch and it was in 2016. And it was expensive. It wasn't wasn't kill me expensive, but it was it was pretty expensive. And Alexander, yeah, just uh, to add one more to look at, uh, check out Potato Jet's YouTube channel. He did a great video, and he did uh, a very similar setup with three screens vertically in his bedroom. It looked really nice. And Courtney, yeah, Alex kind of covered it. The reason uh, it became so popular is the price of these. When the price of a fifty-five inch dropped below three hundred dollars. Uh, that you could get at Best Buy for a 4K display. It's cheaper than a piece of glass to put in a window that size. So <laughs> it makes a lot of, and you can change your location instantly. And Chris? Yeah, Liberty, in terms of the um, beginning of the trend, uh, we looked at building an insert studio. I looked at building an insert studio with a with a guy in, I want to say it was about 96. Oh, wait a second. Oh, this talks about using video displays for windows we were just going to use a window sorry it was nine <laughs> it was 96 but it but it overlooked silicon valley and it was going to be a great place for doing you know uh satellite hits anyway yeah thank was, you alexander because that, that, was that po potato jet was the one like that's where i saw it and i was like oh my goodness because when he showed like the intro to his video and then showed the flip of oh this is just the studio i was like i need those screens in my life next question Next one comes to us from John Foltz in St. Louis Grove, Pennsylvania. I'm looking for a budget-friendly but capable rack mount computer option for vMix and or Caspar CG. Courtney? Well, if you look uh, online at Newegg, there's a, a quite a selection of rack mount cases. You're probably going to have to end up uh, building your own. A lot of these are designed for servers. Uh, some are designed to carry a a standard uh, PC motherboard in there and power supplies, and you can fit your uh, 
all your NVIDIA graphics cards in there, full height graphics cards, a number of them, uh, will this case will accommodate. So take a look on uh, Newegg and build your own. You may have to transplant uh, a regular gaming computer or something into a case like this, but there are a number of them that are available for a fairly reasonable price, but you're going to have to do a little bit of DIY. And Alex? And oftentimes you can find some pretty capable Dell blades. Dell makes a lot of blades that are that will do what you need to do. That's what we have a stack of right now. And I think on eBay, they're about 900 bucks. Next question. Next one comes to us from TJ Asher in Minneapolis. Can one use a Blackmagic 1ME to control pocket cinema 4K cameras, needing full camera control and or communication like exists with Blackmagic Studios 4K cameras? Venue wants to replace Studio 4Ks with Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4Ks for better low light and keep existing lenses. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, the only thing you need to do if you if you move to those is to, is to you got to get the bi-directional HDMI to SDI converters. And so these will have uh, one HDMI and two SDIs and you have to have both of the so you have your cameras um, and you're going to have the HDMI go in and then you have two SDI, one going in, one going out. Um, and that's going to because the your SDI signal from one of your aux outs from your your switcher is what's controlling is sending those control signals and then those get bound back in in the bi-directional uh, converters and so that's what you're going to need there you're not going to be able to change zoom on your lenses you know that doesn't I mean I don't well there's a couple of Panasonics that that you will, can you can there's a handful of them but they're they're the powered the the powered uh, zoom lenses and. I don't think there's any of them that are very good. So the ones that you can actually do zoom in are not lenses that I would use in a broadcast. I might use them as an overhead, <laughs> but that's about that's about it. That's it. Next question. Next one comes to us from Andy Kokendorfer in Vieira, Florida. And Andy says, how does the quality of a live Zoom meeting compare to the quality of a Zoom cloud recording? Has anyone done a PSNR test between Zoom ISO ProRes Capture and Zoom Cloud? Thanks. Alex? Uh, I, I, we haven't done the PSNR test, um, you know, with this. So we could do that. It'd probably be useful. But I can tell you absolutely that the cloud... Uh, content, the cloud recordings for Zoom are almost worthless. <laughs> like, you know, like they're not worthless. I mean, you have a record that people talked and did it, but the compression is so high and so rough that, and then in addition to that, if anyone does a screen share, your entire thing is going to be whatever, uh, you know, whatever ratio that screen share was and whatever resolution and everything's all stretched out and everything else. It is, you know, if, if it matters, do not use the cloud. If, if you're a corporate company and you just want to save that you did the thing, then it's fine. But if you actually care about the content, you're going to, you're going to want to use Zoom ISO and, and capture it. And I will say that Zoom, I, the quality of Zoom ISO, I, I've been using it for some, a bunch of things here and not just for this show, but for other things, the quality of Zoom ISO is considerably higher than a screen scrape. So if you're using, um, so I, I think that it's the visual quality is much higher. It's just, it's the way it's being processed is more efficient. And so, um, so Zoom ISO is going to look better as you do the record. I don't think you need a ProRes recording. You could probably do an ISO recording from a Zoom, A10 ISO or something like that, or an H.264 recording. The ProRes is easier to edit, but it's not going to change the visual quality dramatically. But recording ISO, you know, each one of those signals out with ISO to something that's going to record those um, those signals there is going to be much better than cloud. And, and in addition, you know, it's the, the cloud. I have, I have someone that I work with that has a lot of, does a lot of cloud recordings and they, it's just, it hurts my heart to see that they, that they did that. You know, they have great people come on and talk and then they record it to the cloud and then you're editing it and you're just like, oh, that's just very sad. <laughs> like that, that, that's all you have left of, of that great conversation. So if the stuff matters, record it on, on ISO. If it doesn't matter, then, you know, it's just like a record, then go ahead and use the Zoom cloud. Next question. Ian Anf Alford in London says, what are the most interesting rumors you've heard about NEB announcements coming? Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, there's a lot of rumors floating around that Sony's going to have new cameras. There's um, there's some rumors that are floating around that 2110 is going to be more prominent um, in this this year than than others. Um, and then outside of that, there's just a lot of people that are excited about NAB <laughs> that I talk to. They say, I, I can't say what we're talking about, but uh, we're, we're excited to show new things. So, so we'll see, we'll see what, what actually happens. 
And Bill? And one of the things I'm looking for, I'm actually going to go for a part of one day. I think I'm just going to go for the office hours meeting. And I managed to wrangle my way in to see some friends on the show floor. And I'm actually looking forward to stopping by the Altheon people who I've been chatting with a little bit about what they're doing in the kind of frame IO collaborative editing space. And I'm pretty excited about that. So that's one of the things I'm going to take a look at. I'm pretty excited about office hours. <laughs> the office hours <laughs> broadcast like everyone else. Next question. Next question. Samuel Nordvik in Norway says, how much data would an hour of a 1080p Zoom meeting typically use? John? So according to Zoom, on Zoom support page, they've got bandwidth requirements, and they've got this completely broken down by a one-on-one -on -one video call at high quality, 720, 1080. And then they have for group calling, um, they have uh, 720, 1080, and then gallery uh view and so those numbers um those numbers let's say the one-on-one -on -one for 1080 is 3.8 up and three down and for group calling up to 25 people at 1080 3.8 up three down so if you multiply those by 3600 you get 228 megs for a one-on-one -on -one, 120 uh, 120 megabyte megabits, sorry, for participants, a 25 gallery view. And then uh, 60 minutes, sorry, 14 gigabytes, sorry, bits, small b, giga, 14 gigabits and 10 gigabits down, uh, 13 up, 720 up for gallery of 25. I've got a table if you want it, I'll send it to you. And Alex? I do think it's interesting that, that my measurements of my up speed with 1080p is different than the what the published numbers are. So they're publishing three some, three and some change, and what I'm seeing regularly is um, something closer to 6.2 up. Um, you know, so so I don't know exactly where those numbers come from, but they could be a little bit higher. And Jason. Yeah, I just I I looked and tried to do some some quick math. My router will sort by application. And it, yeah, it's closer to what Alex is saying. I, I think their published, I think their published data might be a little bit optimistic. And to our producers, thank you for your questions. And remember that your the show is driven by you. So as you submit questions, remember to vote up because those are the ones as we get closer and closer to the top of the hour that the most voted questions are the ones that we'll be able to take. All right, next question. Gordon Lake in Los Angeles says, looking for a way to talk to and hear camera operators over the ATEM2 MEHD with I, without a headset. Is there a five pin push to talk microphone and or speaker device that could work? Courtney? I think you're gonna have to go do it yourself here. There are a lot of communications microphones out there that are pushed to talk through design for ham radio or paging systems like this. Um, this is from uh, a static, uh, that's a omnidirectional dynamic push to talk. You're going to have to wire it up because that five pin connector on the ATM is really designed for headsets, uh, with a stereo, uh, pair of earphones and a mic. And there's no really uh, contact closure for push to talk that you could use to operate a relay to turn a speaker on and off. And the problem you're going to have is if you've got an open speaker on comms and anybody else in the room with you is also on comms, you're going to get feedback uh, because they're not going to be on push to talk. Uh, you know, So if they open their microphone, they're going to get feedback over your speaker. So you're going to have to custom wire the switch in a comm mic to automatically. You, know, you hook up speaker to that five pin, look at the pin out, and then you hook up your microphone to the five pin. And you make a, a button that closes a relay that turns off the speaker feed or puts a resistor across it or something that mutes it uh, whenever you press the button to talk. So you're going to have to do a little engineering yourself or get somebody to engineer it for you probably. I don't know of anything off the shelf. Maybe you can find something. I haven't found anything. Next question. Next one comes from Craig Kadoki in Toronto, Canada. Neumann has also released a new tabletop audio interface with some very cool features. It has AES-67 remote controllable from tablets and a web interface. It also looks a lot like the one Douglas posted. It's the same unit with different branding, and it's the Neumann MT-48. Go ahead, Alexander. 
Yeah, it's really cool. I've known about merging technologies for a while because I sell their products. They're really, really high end. They have, they've always had really good dynamic range, excellent preamps, good processing and all that sort of stuff. So it's really interesting to see Neumann effectively partner with merging to do this product. Um, so yeah, it looks like a really compact unit. I haven't had my hands on one of these yet, but I think one of the interesting things about Neumann as a brand is I suspect that this might actually help them sell this product because the merging brand isn't, they're well known around people that know that kind of high-end product, but I think the the more average person coming in that isn't necessarily technical, they, they still know the Neumann brand, they know about Neumann microphones, so I think that may actually help them sell that product potentially. Go ahead, Bill. I also think it's a signpost of how the industry is changing. You've got brands like Neumann, which is a very high-end, hugely respected brand in audio, getting into this space. I was surprised when I first saw it and going, man, it, it's just under $1,500, I think. It's a pretty expensive device, which means that they are not planning this for the bedroom studio crowd. I mean, there are some people who work in that space now who can probably afford it and will do so. Great for them, but obviously at fifteen hundred dollars, this is a serious person for a serious purchase for somebody seriously, probably making money doing this. And I would imagine that the big broadcasters will look at this and go, "Ah, Neumann, I don't have to worry about it. It's just going to work, and I'm going to get the support I need." And that just cut a PO for it. Alex, yeah, I think that there's some name brand advantages. I, I do think it's really dangerous when a company rebrands somebody else's hardware. Like, I, especially when that hardware is still in the market and people go, oh, this looks exactly like that. It, I think it cheapens the brand that, that market, that branded it. And it also increases the, the, the stature of the brand that was copied or, or was, was pulled into it. And I think we see that we're seeing this more often where someone's doing that, but I don't, I don't think it's, I think it's good for merging technologies more than it's good for Neumann to do it because you kind of think, well, Neumann couldn't, what it, what it, sometimes communicates is that Neumann couldn't figure that out. So they, 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 they did it for some, from somebody else. And that doesn't, I don't think that that bodes well for their brand to, to do that. I think they're better off engineering something on their own or buying the company and then re in, in, you know, pulling that in, but, 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 oh, they, and um, it's noted that they, they own them now. They own Martian Technologies now. It's just showed up in our, in our chat. So, so there you go. So you buy the company and then make it happen. And if they're doing that, then that makes more sense. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, it looks interesting. I'm not sure what market they're going out after. Maybe the audiophile who wants bragging rights on his, uh, you know, connection to Zoom. That's what it looks like. It has a touch screen. It has uh, DSP functions in it, including reverb and stuff. And anytime I see something like that on a microphone input, I go, well, not really for this serious broadcaster. Uh, but uh, it would, I guess, you know, for, for people that are doing more broadcasting from home, um, you know, this could be a nice interface for radio stations, et cetera. The other thing that scares me here is I see the little fan port over here on the side. That leads me to be skeptical that uh, you don't want a microphone interface that you're going to be within arm's reach of the microphone that has a fan in it. At least I wouldn't. Go ahead, Alexander. Yeah, I thought Mr. Lindsay's points were are absolutely fair. Uh, also, keep in mind, too, Neumann has been making speakers, studio monitors for a while now with DSP processing in there. So it's not like they don't have engineers that sort of understand that field of from the processing world. So I think it actually does make it a good fit for them. Whether or not this is going to be a successful product line for them, that remains to be seen. And Bill. And more complicated units that are designed for the desktop for people who do have to work in this space. I know with me, the Universal Audio Apollo Solo, I added the Cedar noise reduction to it. And it really did change a lot of my workflow because areas, you know, it takes a little bit of time to get a noise print out of the room. But once it does and it suppresses that noise, I am able to do pickups and cut-ins on the voice work I do in the voice booth from my desk, even though there are some fan noises that are more complex and used to give me trouble, I had to suppress them after the fact, now I can sit here and do voiceover work and put it into the workflow from my voice booth and it works beautifully. So I think these kind of high-end 
more small just indicates that people are even even people who do work on a professional level are moving to needing to have these tools for their home operations where they didn't before and the people who succeed at it can afford this kind of tool fifteen hundred dollars for you know mine my universal audio one cost about three i think so you're seeing the same technology at the high end come into the low end and now you're seeing the high end people saying this is working for people this is what they're buying Let's play this game as well. And Courtney. Yeah, and one feature it has that I didn't mention is it has integrated talkback. So uh, it has separate talkback monitoring and push to talk. So uh, you could integrate it with uh, a comm system that would, you know, not feed. You could set it up to not feed your main program feed when you've got your finger on the talkback button, et cetera. So that comes in really handy without having to have a separate interface just to do talkback. Next question. Next question comes from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. What are some mounting options for the Insta360 link for desktop, top of monitor, and floor standing? Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, there's there's a couple different options. Uh, one of the cool things about the, the Insta360 is that not only can it just hook on to the front of a monitor, but it also has a quarter 20 that goes into the bottom of it. So the um, so that you can just get anything at that point. And you can get little arms that, that we've, we've used, little arms, small tripods. Uh, but anything that attaches, you know, it's it's a it's a very typical tripod mount, you know, the, you know, screw on the bottom. So um, almost anything you can attach to that. There are some monitor um, thing brackets that we've talked about in the past that will go onto the back of the visa mount, and um, and so then and then it just comes up and gives you an array of options across the top. But you know, for most monitors, you'll end up hooking it on. But if you want more control, you can use like newer, make some arms that are kind of like the Noga arms that you can use, and with something that's lightweight, you can make that happen. The we also use lighting tripods. Oftentimes, um, we use these uh, ProMaster ones. I think they're, and I'm going to always screw it up. It's there's four letters, and they're all together. There, it's CT LC or LC. L dash T S, but the ProMaster makes this lighting stand that we can unfold and fold, and we use those a lot. Um, it's a horrible name for their lighting, their lighting stand, but it it is a really useful one. But light stands, you know, are these are such light little cameras that you can just set them on top of them. And, I mean, and screw them onto a light stand, and they work great. Why that model? Or that the, the well, the reason we use that that lighting model specifically is because they have um, that number one is they're very robust, so they don't break a lot. Their tripod, the reason we started using them is that their tripods are, they'll fold up and fit into a 1510 or they'll fit into a carry-on. <laughs> so when they, they fold in on themselves and fit into a, a 1510, or 1510 case, uh, not and which is important to, to me anyway. And so going into a, a carry-on, they also have a low open legs. W what that means is that they have a long stem in the center that doesn't get wider at the top. And the legs open up at the bottom. And the reason that we that's important is because when you're trying to put them in a small space, uh, you have a, a lot of room. In fact, you can take the legs and put them flat on the ground and have them just go out or you can bring them up. And, and so it gives you a lot of flexibility of what you're doing there. And then um, they're really light. And um, and so they're they're all of the all of those things make them. That's our kind of our go to light stands um, for a lot of things. The reason I bought them originally is because they are easy to paint out when you're doing 360 with a theta. <laughs> so, so when you do it, when you have a theta and you screw it on top and you open those up, those and it's the LSCT. Thank you to Alton Christensen, uh, the ProMaster LS-CT, and um, and basically the what happens is the further away the tripod is from the from the theta. The, the less you have to paint out at the bottom because you don't have legs going. They look really huge when you do a 360 image. And so having those legs further away makes this little dot that you have to just, just go in and paint out. And you take it into Affinity Photo because Affinity Photo will map that image onto a sphere and you can rotate it up and then you clone it out really carefully and then rotate it back out. That's how I got into Affinity Photo was not because of, it was a cheaper version of Photoshop because it did something that Photoshop didn't do. And so that's, uh, but that, anyway, that's that's a long answer for um, a, a bit of a, a side <laughs> a side part of this one. But, but it was important too, not only the travel aspect, but that part with the legs and how wide they go out. Because yeah. if you're not doing this a lot, you when you recognize that you have a tight space, because that's the point of the camera, those legs take well, up so much. And the, and the big thing is, is that with and in hotel, I use them in hotel rooms because I can, I can, 
set them flat and they'll go under desks, they'll go under right. things and everything else because the, the tripod itself, will, the legs will just come out and just sit flat down as well. And so there, I can take two of those. I oftentimes have two of those with um, a couple of the 6Cs, the, the Nano, um, the Nano 2, or the, the, the Nanlite 6Cs. And I'll have two of these um, that are, that are, you know, and they all pack into half my whole kit for like when I travel and I'm on office hours fits into half a carry on. And then I fit my clothes into the other half. <laughs> Go ahead, Chris. I was going to say the thing that I find most comforting about this question is that Paul has not given up his quest for the ultimate camera and the ultimate microphone. Good going, Paul. <laughs> Next question. Justin Blankenship in Lebanon, Virginia, says we run our console audio through a Pro Tools session to condition the outgoing audio before it hits our stream. This is done via Dante on site. Is there a way to do this remotely without having to remote into the computer running Pro Tools itself? Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, um, two things there. One is that the, we haven't been able to do it remotely. So there is um, a Yukon, Yukon controller um, that's there. Uh, we have not been successful at doing that off-site so people have tried it um we uh um you know we haven't we haven't been able to get it to work uh, the way we want it to work anyway i don't know we we've the, we've tried we've tried to make that work remotely and, and uh, mickey says he can do it so we'll talk to mickey some more about it but but the uh but we haven't been su super successful with the yukon um remote control system but that that could be the, that that'd be the only place that it would work if it works um, the one thing I will say is that I would never run a live stream that I, you know, unless someone is wedded in Pro Tools, I would never put a live stream through Pro Tools because of the uh, the dropouts that we've seen using Pro Tools that are pretty high end. Um, and so, you know, it just suddenly just like, I'm going to turn off for a second <laughs> and then I'm going to come back. So uh, so those have been something that we've seen regularly on Pro Tools sessions that we're, we're live streaming enough uh, regularly enough it's not like it's every every event but regularly enough you know once every eight or ten events that i was uh, that you know and you wouldn't notice it if you were doing a session but you do notice it when you're doing live and we've definitely had that had that problem next question greg gibson out of washington dc up next did anyone see sony's announcement last week of the srg a12 and a40 pan tilt zoom cameras ai based follow tracking and framing at a three thousand dollar price point they're half inch sensor cameras currently but seems exciting considering the canon's tracking software is a twelve hundred dollar us add-on go ahead alex yeah, I think that I, I'm pretty excited actually about to, to you know see where Sony's going. They they seem to be very aggressive in the ten thousand and below range, and I think that we thought that Sony was kind of I'll be honest, a lot of us ten years ago thought that Sony was a little bit toast you know in this area because they had a lot of expensive solutions. Um, there was Red and Black Magic and other ones you know kind of um, you know st sticking their their hand into there. And Sony has pivoted extremely well, and I think these PTZs, I think at, at a half inch sensor, I would say they're really good for schools, training, um, that type of thing. If it if it's if I was doing broadcast, I wouldn't use a chip so small, um, because it's just everything's in focus and it just looks cheap. But but I think that if you're doing um, uh, if you're doing you know more utilitarian streams, I think that they could be really useful. With auto tracking, I always just want to know what kind of headroom am I going to get? Because I usually feel like all these auto tracking systems uh, give put way too much headroom into the into the scene. So we'll we'll see what happens. Next question. Peter Moore in Auckland, New Zealand's up next. I've been using the ATEM Mini as a TV slash monitor splitter from my Apple TV and MacBook Pro. I've noticed that the audio quality isn't as good as when I'm not using the ATEM. Is there a setting I need to enable or disable? Alex? Yeah, I don't. I, I, um, the quality in the ATEM, I mean, I, I don't, audio quality is not what the ATEM specializes in. So I, I think that if you're passing it through there, you should be able to leave everything at zero and it shouldn't do anything as it goes through. Um, but I'd be interested to know, like when you say the audio isn't, um, isn't the same, what is different? Is it thinner? Is it more compressed? Is it, you know, those types of things is what I'd be looking for. Courtney? Yeah, and make sure the processing, if you're bringing the audio in over the eight, over the uh, HDMI cables as digital, it's coming in as digital audio and it's going out as digital audio, but remember that Fairlight digital signal processing is built into the ATEM there, and so make sure you don't have processing turned on and you're doing something to it inside the ATEM. So go to the audio section and make sure it's set flat and set for unity gain 
and input versus output. And of course, you can tweak it to make it sound a little better to your uh, to your taste and make it sound as good as directly out of your Apple TV, et cetera. And Alexander. Yeah, I guess the question that I have is, I mean, obviously, I don't know what the what the other aspect of the setup is in terms of um, signal processing, but um, I mean, if you're going to have audio going into the ATEM, I mean, basically, you're going to be getting a PCM stereo source. You're not you're losing all the Dolby digital. So I don't know if this is like what we're using this for. Is it for movie watching? So, you know, if you're if you've got a surround processor or AV processor in there and you're expecting Dolby digital stuff to come out, I mean, it's going to definitely sound different. It's going to be stereo. And Alex. Yeah, what Alex said. <laughs> so it's going to be, it's a stereo processor. So anything you send in there is going to come out stereo. So if that's the quality you're talking about, absolutely, it's not going to work. Next question. Uh, Henry Ramos in Yonkers, New York. Can we do a second hour of catch up with OG's Mickey Macador and uh, Macator and Tucker Dragoo? Alex? Yeah, it'd be great. We said if they're, if they're uh, up for it, we'd love to have them. Next question. Uh, Peter, uh, Paul Wallace, excuse me, in Austin, Texas. What are the advantages of changing your YouTube handle? And he says, see YouTube.com handle. Alex? The main thing is it's a lot easier for you to share it with other people. So, the, you know, so if, you, if you're saying, oh, I'm just at YouTube slash my name or slash an organization, it's just much easier. And it also just looks like you actually paid attention to it. So everybody who starts a YouTube channel has some long string on it and it's still there, but it's just being hidden by that handle. Um, but having the handle there means that it's just a lot easier for people to find it. They've also added some regulation to that so that now that if you have the handle, not anybody can just grab onto your handle. <laughs> so claiming your handle now is a little bit more uh, structured than it used to be. Um, it used to be a problem that you'd have, you know, Yahoo's, you know, grabbing onto people's handles and, you know, or, or, or creating something that's like it. And um, YouTube is, you know, working pretty hard. It's a complicated problem that they have. It's a really big system with a lot of people using it, but they are working pretty hard to defend creators. You know, creators are the lifeblood of, of YouTube and, and YouTube is working every day to, you know, really figure out a way to take people who are obviously doing things for nefarious reasons and, you know, knocking them out and, and having it be really something there for creators. But it's, it's hard because, you know, you, know, you have to figure out who's who in, a, you know, in that process. And, and so they're, they're still working on it. But, but the handles help. Next question. David Brady in New York City said, Rogue Amoeba's Farago 2 beta is close to release, and they said it's okay to blab. They've added an OSC layer to it at the suggestions of its beta testers. Can we hope and or ask for the same from products like Loopback and so forth? Jason? I think there's a good possibility. One of the things I really like that Rogue Amoeba does is any benefit to any one of their um, pieces of software, if they can find a reason to do it all the way across their platform, they will. Alex? We'd love to see OSC um, being supported by all of their software. So um, we're hoping, <laughs> we can hope and pray that they're going to add that. The, the Farago makes more sense. That's a that's an audio uh, playback tool. So what it's designed to do is if you're doing a radio show and you want to have a bunch of things, a bunch of effects or clips or other things that you want to play and you just want to have a kind of be able to just select things and have it play out, um, that is what it's designed to do. And OSC makes so much sense for that. I don't know if it makes sense for everything they do. And they may put a lot of work into the other things and not get a lot of response. But I, I feel like with the Farago, they would, there's a lot of people that would use it. So the ROI is very high for that. So you can see why they would do it there first. But hopefully they'll take that knowledge and, and reproduce it. And for our producers, continue to keep that voting going. And we have space for a couple more questions before we get to the top of the hour. Next question. Douglas Carmichael, would shift option be a key sequence that conflicts with anything else in Mac OS? I tried out the control option key sequences I use with better touch tool on a 14 inch MacBook Pro and curling my fingers was uncomfortable on the smaller size unit. Jason? Yeah, you're never going to be able to get a superlative like, oh, this won't conflict with anything at all in, in any Mac OS application. It's just not going to happen. I, I would start with um, option function if you're on a on a laptop. That might give you a better set. And Bill? Yeah, and I was just going to add, you know, apps also load up their own things. I know in Final Cut, there is a gigantic list of keyboard shortcuts that include all sorts of control shift option 
four functions. So each potential keyboard uh, combination is probably in use somewhere in the apps world already. So you just have to you have to kind of try to find your space. If you're not using anything else and you're just on the desktop, it's often not that big a deal to use those complex keyboard things. But you, as soon as you launch an app, you can get into conflicts. Next question. Comes from uh, Brett Bilou in Appleton, Wisconsin. Without risking any spoilers, the commentary after last night's Succession episode discussed the epic 30-minute one-take shot with three film cameras and needing to hide new rolls of film all over the set. Is shooting film still that much better than digital? Courtney? Well, it depends. For television, uh, when you can go directly from the uh, film negative and digitize it directly into digital video, um, it gives you a certain look. Uh, if you're going to film uh, two or three generations down in film using a complete film, non-digital uh, post-production workflow like Chris Nolan tries to do, uh, it gets it deteriorates pretty quickly, and digital actually looks a little better because it preserves. You know, you don't lose a layer. Uh, you know, you don't lose resolution as you go, as you dupe the film going down. And I don't know how strange this, you know, uh, unusual this three film cameras, single 30 minute take was, but, you know, we used to do that in sitcoms on film for decades. Uh, you know, I remember working on Will and Grace, four camera set up, all running Panavision film cameras, 35 millimeter with 2000 foot loads. And Jim Burroughs, who's directing it, wouldn't even cut the camera if uh, a, a joke fell flat. They would uh, just uh, say, hold it a minute, and they'd run in, and the writers would run in, they'd rewrite the line. Cameras are all still rolling, four cameras rolling film. And uh, they'd start the scene again, and uh, no one would ever cut because it took so long to slate all four cameras, get them started, et cetera. So uh, it's not unusual to run multiple film cameras, hiding, hiding mags around the set because you only have 11 minutes if you're using 1,000-foot loads uh, is a bit of a problem uh, if you have to do a 30-minute take. So you do have to reload those things on the fly. So that camera is going to be down for 30 to 40 seconds while they reload. And Alex? I just find it hilarious that they were using film for a 30 minute for a 30 minute capture. I'm sorry. It's just like, oh, my goodness, that was what a crazy idea. Like, like you know, it, I, I'm sorry. I, I there was a time when ever, there's a lot of people that are glad that they shot film and produced short um, shows in film in the 80s, 70s and 80s and 90s, because the, the, the folks that mastered on just video, if you look at like the I think the old A-team episodes, and some of the other things are all that you could tell that they mastered them on video because now when we see them today, they're still in their their four by three, you know, low resolution, you know, format. And so I, I think they're glad. But the resolution and the and the quality of the image has grown dramatically over time to the point where digital in general uh, has a larger range um, and and a higher resolution than film if you choose to. And it is, it's just so much more flexible. The fact that you would clamp down into film to shoot any production right now, I feel like is just, you know, it's, it's a director or a cinematographer that has enough juice that they can just say they want to do this because it's dumb. You know, <laughs> it's a dumb thing to do. And, and so, and people get to do stuff. I mean, I walked into a store the other day that, had, that sold Polaroids and people still like to buy Polaroids and take pictures with Polaroids because it's, it's a limited look um, that they have there. But film is just absurd at this point. Like shooting, like doing, it wasn't absurd five years ago or 10 years ago. But at this point, the digital cameras are so good that, you know, unless I was shooting on some crazy high resolution, like IMAX is worth shooting in film because it's the equivalent of something that's much higher resolution than than what you can get. So an IMAX frame makes sense. But if you're shooting Super 35, uh, not so much. Bill? It's also a homage back to those days when nobody had ever done it before. And now that a lot of people have done it, and there's plenty of famous things, but I still remember the first time I saw Orson Welles' Touch of Evil with that famous opening shot that lasts forever. And when I was studying it to understand what they had to do to get those cranes to go over the buildings and everything, uh, 
somebody pointed out, look at that last shot. This is a single take, and you can see that the sun is coming up. And they started at like 8 o'clock in the evening. So they shot and reshot and reshot and reshot and reshot all night long and finally nailed it on the last one as they were losing their light. And it just something about the lore of people trying to do something special still is. And I hope people are still doing that, even though we have the unlimited ability to hit a record button and say, no, stop, redo it, stop, redo it, do a piece of it, composite it later. There's something about getting that whole crew together around an epic effort like that and finally pulling it off that I just think is still satisfying in a very human way. And Courtney. Yeah, as Alex said, it used to make sense for future proofing because uh, you didn't know what technology was going to deliver in the future, uh, especially if you're going for a television release. Uh, television was increasing in resolution, uh, and film really wasn't hadn't changed in a hundred years, really. So uh, you can um, shoot in film and transfer to a higher resolution later on. Uh, but there ran into problems for like with Star Trek: Next Generation where they shot on 35 millimeter film, so uh, and it was designed for standard deaf television back in the days. But the problem is they did all the effects digitally. This is when they were first starting to do digital video effects or digital visual effects. Uh, and they did them all at standard resolution in post. They did all the visual effects were done in video resolution in post. So now they can't go back and recreate all those uh, uh, visual effects in high def, so they're stuck with the uh, low resolution 480i. Yeah. Next question. Douglas Carmichael, the emerging tech, the merging, not emerging, merging technologies, Anubis audio interface, use, utilizing Ravina and AES67, seems to be the perfect network and audio platform for the small studio. Has anybody had any experience with it? And there's a link there to the Anubis. Alex? Yeah, I think there's a couple of questions about this. I mean, I wouldn't... I wouldn't use Ravenna unless I was at scale. Like, so the Ravenna is a really powerful tool and it's open-ended and it can be there, but I wouldn't use it in a small studio. Next question. Tommy Shantz in St. Paul, Minnesota. What would be the best way to duplicate a PowerPoint that is run to a projector into an ATEM, old Windows 7 machine in play? Alex? I would run it one output out and then split it. So you know, run into something that's going to either split the HDMI or split to SDI or do whatever you need to do there. But don't don't try to send it. Don't try to send PowerPoint out to two outputs out of your, out of your laptop. Um, you want to just send it out once and then have it split to the things it needs to go to. Next question. Peter Moore in Auckland, New Zealand. Apologies if asked before, been unwell, but any NAM coverage planned or just cursory coverage? Alex? I have to admit, because NAM is so close to NAB, we're not doing a lot of formal coverage, but we are. Jeffrey's going to be there, um, and uh, and Nick Bat is going to be there, and I think we're going to get some windows with both of them at least. Uh, if you contact me in Discord, if you're someone who is covering it, uh, NAM, we may have. Uh, we're, we're looking at sending the live view down um, to do some shooting there, um, so that we can kind of test the system and kick the tires, so to speak. Um, so so definitely let us know if you're going to be there, and um, and we'll see if we can do it. I'm hoping to do two or three hours each. Each day of some tests, um, you know, not tests, but it'll be coverage. But what we're really doing is, is seeing like, what are we missing for the for the NAB coverage? But um, I'm glad that NAM next year will be go, going back to something that gives us a little bit more space, putting it uh, right before NAB really clamped down on what we could what we could do. Next question. Uh, Douglas Carmichael is back to a previous topic. What cost effective AES 67 Ravina IO boxes could I use to add inputs to emerging technologies Anubis interface? Alex? If you calculate time into your into what you're talking about, there is no cost effective way to use Ravenna. <laughs> like, you know, so if if you're if you're gonna use it in a large, large system, we have a couple people that we work with that have very small systems and they're using Ravenna and the amount of overhead that Ravenna you know creates for a small studio. Now, when you're talking about the Olympics or you're talking about big things, it's open ended and it's and it and you can get a lot of things out there and you can design your pipeline whatever however you want. And Ravenna's really great for that. For small studios, you should use Dante. Next question. Kenny Hampton in Greenville, Illinois. Speaking of film, how were film copies distributed to theaters with optimal quality? How was this done without generation degradation? Courtney? It was not done without generation <laughs> degradation. 
that's the secret answer. But actually what, what happens is uh, oh the original camera negative is shot, and uh, then you print work print off of that. The editors edit the work print. They preserve the original camera negative uncut. And then uh, once they get a final, once they lock the picture and editing off the work print, they go back and conform the original camera negative to the cut work print uh, with using edge numbers. And then they print, they create a printing master off of that original camera negative, which is one generation down from the original camera negative. And that printing master is used to duplicate and turn out the uh, answer prints or the prints that go out to the theaters. Uh, so you're at least two generations down to get to the theater. And if you're going through optical effects, you're three generations down and so on. So uh, you can get much further down. And a lot of times that printing master that they're using to duplicate everything for the theaters will wear out, obviously, after they print 100 or so or 200, run it through the printer two or 300 times. So they got to generate another one. And hopefully they can go back to the original camera negative and they can only go back to that so many times before it starts to fall apart. So. Usually you're, you're at least three generations or four generations down by the time those prints get to the theater via a truck. Alex? Three to five generations. Yeah, to everything that goes out is three to five generations. The most, the, the highest profile stuff got three. The Everything else got five. Um, and they made the copies right at the very beginning of that print master so that they wouldn't hit the print master. You know, so you'd make a, a copy. So you'd have the print master, then you have a copy of the print master, and then you take that one. So that's the second generation, and you copy it a bunch of times, and then you copy those. And, and it depends on how many, how big the, the run is. It, it was um, the, I can tell you that we did a bunch of tests that calculated exactly what the resolution was um, of the, the end product because we were trying to figure out how long it would take to render. And it was a sep roughly, um, uh, 1700 by, uh, nine something or other, but that's what the resolution was of the, of the generation that went to the theaters. So, um, a couple hundred pixels less than HD, <laughs> which is what, what a fifth generation, uh, super, uh, 35 millimeter, uh, uh, film would, would go out at. And Chris. And Kenny, I know your question was about what, um, Courtney and Alex just talked about, but there's also the what Courtney alluded to, putting it on a truck. There's a really charming old story of um, when they finished, or they were very close to, I think, picture lock on Gone with the Wind. They they packaged it up, put it in a car, they drove it somewhere out into the valley, and they found a theater. They had prearranged a theater, and they walked in and they said, "We're not going to let. If you need to go, you're more than welcome to go. But we have one more movie to show you. We want to get your opinion on it." And they played Gone with the Wind to a, a crowd for the first time back in the late 30s. Uh, and I just, I, I love this idea of like this picking up this, you know, this masterpiece, putting it in a box or a bunch of boxes, and then driving it across town to show it to people. Film distribution is much different these days. Oh, man. Next question. Alexander Knight in Vancouver, British Columbia up next. Who makes a reasonably priced large and or sturdy video camera fluid head? Alex, you just have to decide what you what you mean by that, you know, so so, the, you know, there's at the five hundred dollar range, five hundred seven dollar range. Benro makes a couple of them that aren't too bad, as well as um, the ACE tripods from Sackler um, are, aren't aren't too bad. The ACE ones are a little light. Um, the the Benros have they have just a little bit of play right at the beginning of the pan drives me a little crazy so so i don't use the i use them as heavier heads but the main thing is so as a large sturdy tripod the ben rose are great at the price point that they are at if you want to actually do pan and tilts you start getting into the sackler 18s and above and if i do something that matters i'm looking at what used to be called an o'connor 2060 or or a sackler 2575 um, those are big ones and i just rent them because they're they're really expensive and they're really worth it. You know, the, the even I even notice I, you know, even a 1030 from O'Connor, which is much, you know, $5,000 head is still, you can still see it in the pan. <laughs> and so, so you can, you know, so for these fluid heads, you, you really, they're, they're, because they're so durable, the rental, the rental ratio of how much it costs to rent for a day is so small compared to the cost of buying it, that it doesn't make sense to own those bigger tripods most of the time. Um, you know, and so I had ones that were in the, the kind of the, the, the 10, 30 range, um, for what we, what we did. Um, and, but most of what I have laying around are Ace and Ben Rose, you know, Aces and Ben Rose, because we use those on a general day-to-day -day basis. They do fine. 
But when it matters, we go out and rent them. And Chris? Totally agree, Alex. Uh, another thing about tripods. Tripods are one of these things that, um, what's the, there's a great line that says you, uh, you marry your lens, but you date your camera. Okay, so it's kind of the it's kind of the same thing. If you buy a great tripod, a great tripod, you could have it for several cameras. Okay, and it's several really, decades. yeah. And so keep in mind that this is a great example of you know buy once, cry once. It's really worth it to invest in something that's really great, like maybe even a little more than you're comfortable spending. And I'll also say this. Tripods are something you really have to touch. You have to touch it. I could tell you whatever you want to hear. And, and until you touch it, you don't know. Like Alex's comment about there's a little extra thing in the beginning of the pan. I would highly recommend at some point, somebody, maybe maybe Mr. Brady could, could organize this. We have an office hours field trip. And we all go to B&H together. It'd be a yeah. blast. B&H is great because you can touch everything. They have a great showroom. And yeah, you really have to touch tripods. Next question. Next question comes from Idris Heggie in uh, Fairfax, Virginia. And the question is, where do you start with Dante tutorials so that I can use them for a classroom AV? Alex? Audinate does their own certification and it is free and it is great. Like if you want, you should be, you know, if you want to do, learn how to use Dante, take Don, take Audinate's courses um, they are fantastic, and they don't cost you anything. And you get a little piece of paper at the end, or I don't know, a digital piece of paper for it. And Nigel? I'm just going to echo that. I think the other thing that's great about that certification, the networking skills you get, even if you're not going to do Dante, are really good. So, But go all the way at least through two. I've not done three yet. Thank you so much, producers, for your questions on the first hour. And that's so interesting that uh, the last question was on learning. And we have Rob Garrett with us, art director, content creator, and production specialist expert. That's where we'll go with it. Rob, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thanks, Liberty. Uh, it's really good to be here. And uh, it's been a long time since I've uh, tuned in. I had completely forgotten just how amazingly knowledgeable and nerdy both the host and the audience are. It's uh, It was a little bit intimidating, actually, for the last, uh, you know, a uh, little bit, you know, sitting here listening to all the incredible questions. And then, I mean, this is the space that you've been in for the the past seven seven plus years in in the learning space, but then now you're getting back into the creative space as well. And I think this is going to be a really good discussion, especially for our producers as they kind of listen in to see where they can jump in on how to really build quality learning um, learning projects, how to even connect with leaders in people in leadership that you need to get them on camera they need to tr produce training material how did you get into this space if you could tell us a little bit about that story yeah i started off um as a production artist uh, you know sort of at the very dawn of the desktop publishing age uh, i was a music major in college and then switched to business and then accidentally discovered the whole desktop publishing thing and um uh kind of stumbled my way through you know in hindsight it looks like a career at the time it was just like full reaction mode to trying to pay my rent and um you know it uh um very slowly one of the things that was always kind of a component of me it was two things number one was learning uh new skills and and, and technologies because they were just coming in at the time and um the other thing was sharing what I learned, um, whether it was with the people I was working around um, in the bullpen or, you know, uh, also doing kind of um, one on one piano style lessons. There was no Internet yet back then. And uh, I was teaching people, you know, going over to their house and sitting with them at their computer and teaching them how to use Photoshop and uh, PageMaker and Quark and, you know, whatever else was you know, we were doing at the time. And uh, very slowly, um, you know, started acquiring different skills like uh, uh, 3D uh was you know when i i first learned uh electric image alex Lindsay will uh, remember that fondly or not right. fondly <laughs> uh, very fondly very fondly <laughs> and um uh and then slowly uh switched over to cinema 4 actually it was really abrupt switching over to cinema 4d in the late 90s 
Um, and then uh, I was art director at Fox Kids. And this is a long winded way of kind of taking me to the to the how I got to Linda.com. But I was teaching at the Art Center in Pasadena um, and uh, I had a uh, several classes, several different types of classes that I taught. Um, I got really tired of teaching kids the buttons every term. And so I sat down and recorded what I didn't realize at the time was an essential training for both Cinema 4D and After Effects so that I wouldn't have to teach anybody the buttons anymore. I could say, go watch this video, damn it. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, creative creative stuff in class. And um, that video leaked out, um, even though it wasn't supposed to, of course. And then my friends at Maxon reached out about um, coming and uh, doing some courses at lynda.com, which was, um, they were looking for a new Cinema 4D person. Um, uh, eventually, I started work recording content for lynda.com as an instructor and then uh, was offered the opportunity to come in and as a content manager, which is a new type of job that didn't really exist before. Um, this was in 2010, I think it was. Um, and uh, uh, it's kind of like a, a department chair at a university and a magazine or sorry, a, 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 a recruiting and sales position uh, had a baby together. And and uh, those two jobs um, were just an amazing combination of what I'd already been doing. I I was speaking a lot at conferences for Maxon. I was teaching at Art Center. I was a freelance artist, you know, editor, animator, creative director, whatever I needed to do for the job uh, around LA. And uh, along comes this incredible opportunity. And so I kind of jumped out of that world and into what I thought was going to be a small business that ended up getting bought by LinkedIn and then getting bought by Microsoft. And uh, suddenly you're working at a gigantic corporation uh, and uh, still serving the needs of people, but uh, from a very different point of view. But anyway, that was a sort of a really quick uh, sort of journey to how I got to uh, into the education space. Um, the, the thing that was interesting was when I started uh, the, Online education was only just really becoming a thing. Linda really pioneered that. Uh, she started off by doing her her training sessions live in in Ojai, and then she started recording those on VHS, and then she started selling those VHS, and then she started putting them on DVD, and then there was the ability uh, uh, somewhere in there to start putting videos on the internet. And uh, she decided to go all in on that and really uh, build something that I think nobody had ever seen before. And um, one of the things that I want to uh, get to, I have a, a slide deck um, that kind of to talk through. It's really not uh, just more like notes for some of the talking points that we can go through. But um, the the one of the things that Linda did, I think, it, you know, aside from the the pioneering ways that she really started to package information for the Internet. Um, was she built uh, just a shockingly talented team of people, um, and uh, which I was very fortunate to be a part of. Those people built a machine, really, to churn out thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of content a year, uh, more content than any network has ever thought about creating and on a just a ridiculously consistent basis. And um, the all of that starts with you know, a very simple idea, which is what are you teaching and who you're talking to, and then progresses all the way through what are really the the normal production steps that we'd all recognize. Um, but it was the the sheer amazing consistency of every step of that process, which made the the Linda experience uh, um, remarkable, I think. And that's what, like, just even having time to speak with you before this show is like, there's the business side of it, of the business of e-learning and how to, and the processes that are involved, but then also as a creative and that part of things. And then the the experts, the influencers that you are connected to and really creating platforms for them. And as you just mentioned, the overall innovation in this space, I think it's estimated that e-learning by 2020 25, and that number's probably changed by now, but it's a $325 billion industry and just how all of those pieces play together. And like, let's jump to your presentation so that as our, our panel and producers, please feel free to jump in with your questions um, for Rob as we talk through his presentation. Go ahead, Rob. Cool. I'll go ahead and share that window. Um, 
and uh, let's see, go there it is, there it is right there. Sorry, this is my Zoom mumbling voice. <laughs> see if I got that right. Everybody, thumbs up if you can see. Whoops, if I, yep. Yes, we can. can everybody see. see everything okay? Yes, thank you. Cool. I'll leave it out of play mode and we'll just skip through. Um, I already kind of gave you an introduction to who I am uh, a Katimari ball of learning. I create cool things and I build relationships and I help people. Um, that's kind of my current LinkedIn profile description. Um, I did what a lot of folks did um, during the pandemic, which was uh, I embarked on the great resignation and uh, decided to get out of the corporate space and back to my uh, out of email and spreadsheet land and back into uh, creativity. And I've been uh, over the last year making personal projects and kind of rediscovering all of the skills that I thought I'd forgotten. Um, when you get swept up into uh, a corporate job like that and uh, the email and spreadsheets take over. Um, you know, over my career, I've developed a, a, a ton of skills. Um, I put learning at the top for a reason um, because it's one of those things that you just can't ever, ever, ever stop doing. Um, you know, the teaching and the communication kind of came along for the ride for that for me. It was all accidental and the 3D motion design, video editing post, um, video production, the PC maintenance, you know, writing, networking, information editing, all of that stuff is are things that, you know, all of us accrete over time. I think that's probably the the thing that, again, was a little bit intimidating by the sitting in and listening to all the questions is just how much this audience is in tune with that. You know, you can't be a professional in this world anymore without learning all the time. And it's uh, pretty amazing. Um Pretty amazing. So uh, personal skills, I had to throw those in there. I love skiing. Uh, I live in Bend, Oregon. So if anybody on the stream is ever in Bend, Oregon, please uh, look me up. Uh, we got Mount Bachelor here and uh, it's been an amazing season, knock on wood. Um, I love cooking. I picked that up from my mom. Um, I've always been uh, a cyclist and um, that's actually part of the story of the journey that let me led me to lynda.com actually. Uh, happy to tell that uh, after hours, but um uh, and then music. I, I said that earlier. I started as a music major in college and then uh, never really left that um, that love behind when I uh, switched uh, out of that stuff. And so um, uh, that's a, a very quick rundown of who I am and kind of how I got here. Um, so let's talk about educational content creation. There's there's um, uh, the steps are things that everybody would recognize uh, from the production world. Um, there's, you know, Education video is video, right? And so there, there's things you can't ignore in the process. You have to know strategy. You have to figure out who's going to be on camera. You have to sit down and write what the heck it is you're going to be uh, talking about on screen. You have to capture uh, and create the thing that's going to get edited in post-production. Then you have to watch it all down uh, and then fix it. And then you have to deliver it out to an audience, right? Those are all the same steps. It's it's a recognizable part of the process. What I wanted to try and focus on today was uh, talking about um, some of the things that at each of those steps that um, hang people up um, are the com some common pitfalls or things that are some little nuggets that um, you know, I recognized as a, a content strategy person and also my production background and working with folks that uh, we noticed along the way. So let's start off with um, the strategy, which, you know, strategy comes down to what are you teaching, who are you talking to first and foremost, and what are you going to teach them? Um, it's something that uh, it seems like such an easy question, but everyone always forgets. Um you know, the one of the things I said earlier, um, the the beauty of the Lynda.com experience um, back in the day was that Linda built a team of people that was um, laser beam focused on every step of this process. And so, and so I, I was part of the, the content strategy team and our job was to figure out what people needed to learn in a given subject area and then to find subject matter experts to teach that subject and then work with them to develop really solid um, ideas for courses and then pass that idea in a package off to a production team that is now laser beam focused on getting that product to the finish line um, in a really consistent way. And so uh, the strategy uh, that we worked on, it was really just, again, you know, what is it that uh, a person in a given field needs to learn how to do? And uh, 
also at a given level of of learning. Um, you know, so when I first started with Linda, my role was a content manager for video production and motion design. And so, uh, you know, it starts off with, you know, asking the question, what are those subjects, right? And you, you build out a curriculum that um, teaches uh, the processes of, of both of those uh, subjects. And uh, you're teaching in the case of video production, for example, it's going to be, you know, pre-production, uh, production and post, right? You kind of divide it into those big three buckets. You start to subdivide and, and, um, uh, list out all of the skills that people need to know. Um, and which brings up a really important concept, which is, um, are you teaching someone a tool? Are you teaching someone a skill? What I mean by that is Premiere Pro is a tool. Video editing is a skill. Um, and the, if you're teaching the skill of video editing that can be taught without software, uh, you can, there's a, a lot of ways to do that visually. Um, if you're teaching Premiere Pro, you got to sit down inside the software, right. And teach those buttons. Um, but you know, uh, Premiere Pro is not video editing. Video editing is something that you do using Premiere Pro. And so that's a really important distinction in the strategy process. How are you, you know, what are you going to be teaching them a tool or a skill? Um, and then you have to ask the question, is this going to be a one-off course or is it part of a curriculum? A curriculum is something that you follow to reach to a, a, a specific end learning result, right? And a one-off course might be something that you are teaching, you know, um, how to use a, a masking tool inside of Premiere Pro. And, you know, uh, the subject of video editing might be part of a larger curriculum of creating a, a post-production professional. Um, and then depth and length um, are very closely related. Uh, you know, the the depth is related to how much of the the skill or the tool are you going to be covering. Um, and you know, you only have so many hours. You could teach the entire subject of video editing and the software associated with it, but you know, you're going to be creating many, many, many hours of content. And so you have to ask the question: Do people have time to sit down and watch all of this stuff? And so that's where you kind of you know figure out from a strategy standpoint, how much can we afford to create versus how much do we think people are going to actually want to learn? And Liberty, please don't hesitate to jump in. I will keep on going. I was uh, waiting for you, you know, to get to the who's going to teach. I have a question waiting for you. But yes, let's let's. Keep OK, going cool. Well, that's actually that's a really good point. So, you know, the 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 depth, length and flow, you know, how many chunks are you breaking into? And then the tone, you know, is um you know, or is it a subject? And this is definitely related to the instructor and in, in who's going to teach it. You know, some people are capable of delivering a really fun, lighthearted tone and other people are very serious. You have to really kind of know and understand your instructor uh, so that you are not putting them in a situation so that you're really setting them up for success. And so, uh, Liberty, why don't we transition to the next slide and talk about the instructor? And I think you had a question. Yeah, that was just like, it, and what are some of the qualities that you you look for? How do you know? And just fun fact, you know, Cher Jones has been on Office Hours. Uh, yes. She was last spring and you actually recruited Cher. And if you want to tell that story and just even talking through that, because we do have people and I see producers, thank you so much. And the panelists has some questions. So we might dip in and out with some of their questions. Nice. But yeah, that sounds that great. What does that process look like? You know, so um, prior to, so when when it was just Linda.com, I was leveraging a lot of my own existing industry connections. I'd been in the production game for, you know, close to 20 years when I first started uh, with uh, Linda back in those days. And so I had a, a ton of people. And that was really one of the, you know, the things that brought me to Linda was my extensive uh, network of people. And I was very fortunate to know a lot of folks and to have worked with a lot of people in a, across a wide range of subjects. Um, when we got bought by LinkedIn, I started to look on LinkedIn. And that was actually, you know, uh, when I met Cher, I, I saw her actually on someone else's live stream. And I was like, hey, she has all of the qualities that are listed here on screen. And, in you know, when you look for an instructor, um, knowing a subject isn't enough. You have to um, have the ability to communicate that subject in a meaningful way. And one of the things, or th these four things are really what we look for in an instructor. Um, 
uh, in it, I think, you know, if you're, if there's anybody on the, the call that is thinking about uh, either doing this themselves or building a business around educational content creation, um, and you're looking to recruit instructors, these four things, credible, generous, easy to work with, empathetic. Um, if you can find people with those qualities, you will be setting yourself and your business and them up for success when you deliver it. Uh, and that was the thing that led me to share, you know, I, I saw her and, you know, you can see that right off the bat, right? You know, she's an amazing personality on camera and she's built her entire personal brand around sharing what she works. That means she's generous, right? She's got the goods and, and the credibility from hearing her talk. Um, and then I had a call with her and it was like, oh my gosh, she was so easy to work with. Like, you know, um, you know, it was really easy to set up a, a meeting with her. She responds right away, you know like you can tick off all, all the things that make it pleasurable to work with someone right. or what you look for in that category. And then empathetic, I put a giant arrow next to that one because it really is the most important quality. How many times have, you know, I think everybody on this call has gone onto YouTube and looked to learn something. And you punch in a, a question, um, you know, uh, how to use, how to learn um, a hard surface modeling and ZBrush. That's something actually I was, trying to learn, uh, that I'm still trying to learn right now. And I found an amazing instructor. I'm not going to call anybody out, but I found an amazing instructor, uh, or made it what I thought was an amazing course. And, uh, um, it was a fantastic promo he created. He's selling it on Gumroad. I go and buy it and, uh, I sit down to watch the videos and, uh, uh, it's not what I expected. Um, it's a person who is an amazing artist who knows ZBrush inside and out, but is not teaching me how to do hard surface modeling. He's just showing me the tools that he uses in his workflow. And it's not the same thing. It's not a, uh, I, I can learn from it, but it's not the same thing as sitting down and teaching me those tools. And so the, the, the empathetic part of this equation means that you remember what it was like when you were trying to learn something and you can now communicate with a person who's, frustrated and sitting down. They just want to learn how to use the pen tool in Photoshop. Damn it. I need to learn this so I can mask out this thing and get on with my day. And you can sit down and sell them what the pen tool is, why it's important, how to use it and get them through to meet their goal and get out the door on the other side of it. And that's where that empathy comes in. You're not trying to prove your own expertise. You're not trying to um, wow someone with the amazing, your amazing skills to move around inside the 3D interface. Um, it's really about remembering what it was like when you were starting out. And that that empathy is is really critical. And um, you know what? Rob, oh, sorry, go is, ahead. oh, no, no, just that that empathy part of, of you sharing that. And what I'm thinking would really work well here is if we go to the panel, get some oh, of their yes. questions and because the community, their questions are piling up and we will come back because you have to share that five step process with us or not. I know they will have <laughs> they'll have my tail for that. Go ahead. I put Alex. it. There's an ellipsis. I got this. I got the uh, I got another slide for that. Awesome. Alex. Yes. Hey, Rob. It's good to see you. So uh, Rob, Rob's an old friend. <laughs> so so anyway, it's really glad to have you on. Um, the uh, how do you deal with? Because we've had the discussions of me doing training, and the hard part has been always like building into the structure has been hard. You know, like for an instructor, even someone who's done training. I get, you know, I would get the spreadsheets of this is what we need to structure. And I'd be like, oh, okay, I'll get back to that at some point. How do you, <laughs> you know, like, and never came back, you know, like, I was just like, I go, because it, it wasn't that I didn't want to do it. I was like, yeah, I'll get to that. And then I go, oh, I don't know. And I think that the challenge really is, and I just wondered how you weigh this out. You, you have people with a bunch of information, a bunch of knowledge that may not have the time to structure it. And how do you figure out a way to support those kinds of instructors that may have a lot of um, may have a lot of knowledge, but not the time to to build it out and and to do the things that are necessary to make it a great training product. Yeah. So there's there's two components to that. Number one, the 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 important thing if you're out trying to find someone or you or you know maybe you're contracted to work with someone like that who is uh, a, a known industry quantity with a ton of stuff on their plate and multiple businesses to run. And they have uh, just this wealth of knowledge and uh, that you are, are tasked with bringing to the world. The question becomes, 
how much do you uh how much are you able to rely on them versus how much um you know do you want them to do you want to do for them and in the case of uh for when i you know my time at linda and linkedin we really didn't we're, we're focused on volume um quality and quality first and then volume we have to push a lot of content through uh to try and and cover all the subjects that we do and we don't really have time to do that sort of thing and work with people and so that easy to work with category one of the things that we look for in the easy to work with category is do they have the time to commit to our process and that's where the sample video comes in um one of the filter mechanisms we use uh, in the content management process is the sample video. And what we're asking people to do is to commit to creating uh, a three to five minute sample video that teaches um, uh, in our method, which is this five-step process. And here I'll arrow down uh, in the five-step process. And every video, when you watch a, a Linda or LinkedIn video, you'll see this flow. And there's no, this isn't like a magic secret. We've been doing it for years, but it's kind of permeated the industry now. You tell them what you're going to tell them. You tell them why it's important. You tell them and show them. Remind them why it's important. Get out clean. And uh, if you do those five steps, every video kind of falls right into place with those. You know, it it comes out right about the right length. Um, it comes out to a really nice flow. And you get a really quality product on the other end. Very consistent as well. And that's every movie in the in the course. So if you're doing a course that has 20 movies in it, um, you want to follow this five step process in each one of those 20 movies. But so the sample video that I talked about before is a way to help filter for that that um, uh, work ethic, work uh, availability. If a person can't commit to making the five minute video, they probably can't commit to working with you to develop the TOC to um uh, having regular Table meetings with the producer, they can't commit to, um, uh, you know, a recording session, like on and on and on. If they can't mm -hmm. do this part, it's not because they're a bad person or anything like they might just have too much stuff going on. And yeah. so the, your goal as the, as, um, a content manager in that situation is to kind of filter that out. Sometimes it's a person that you really want to get into the library and then you'll offer to help them with a lot of those stages of the process, but you have to really way out. And for the folks on the call that you may be contracted and you have to, like, you got to get this CEO to sit down and record their thoughts about leadership um, because that's your, your job and you're being paid to do that. So now you have to say out loud in a sentence, okay, I'm going to work with this CEO. Um, I know they're super busy. I'm going to support them through the process. And I'm going to, to put, uh, I'm going to work with their assistant and put a time on their calendar for the for a, a sample video and i'm going to give them a script and i'm going to to set up a pre-call and have and work through that script with them let them tweak it and made you know put it into their voice and then sit down with them on a day you know in front of their webcam and record something like there's ways to work around that but you have to really know up front you know how much you want to do it yeah and because we've had experts i know when we were building training <laughs> long ago with db garage we had experts, I was like, this person knows a lot. And I would literally just have them come in and record, just dump, you know, and we literally called them brain dumps. It was this, the product it was just, I just need you to dump the information out. And then sometimes we would build training products against it. We'd have other people like learn from theirs that already knew it and then yep. build out the training. But just like, I just need you to get it out of your head, you know, and then, and then we're going to figure that out. The other thing that we've been, you know, playing with on, on YouTube a lot, and I'm just curious what your opinion is of this is, you know, we've been reordering this a little bit, the, the five steps that you're talking about, which is that in YouTube, we're finding that people won't stay, stay there very long if you start talking about why it's important. And so we just put, yes. we just show you immediately. So the first 90 seconds is the thing, right? Because when someone, it used to be like, hey, subscribe to my channel, and this is why yeah. this is important and setting it all up. <laughs> but yes. someone just saw the title that said how to use the clone tool. And when they click on it, they want to see the clone tool. <laughs> like, you know, like, yep. and, and, and so what we've been doing is re playing around with reordering some of these for some of our clients where the first 90 seconds is they, you get to see it. Now, if you stay, 
there's another minute or two minutes or three minutes that talks about why that's important and it sets it mm -hmm. all up and and digs yep. into it deeper and gives you more detail. But the idea is is that when you when you hit the button, you're immediately into you already know what you 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 know why it's important because you were searching for it. Yes, exactly. That's in you know that's the um it, it's really a, kind of amazing how YouTube has changed the the you know changed every game really right it's changed the broadcast game it's changed the education game it, it it's changed everything and it's it's having a huge impact on how uh information gets delivered that's something that um what you just described that phenomenon is of of kind of reordering the information is uh it's starting to you'll you you'll see it if you go on the LinkedIn learning site now you'll see that it's something that we noticed a while ago and had started to shift this um you know it kind of comes back to the question of tools versus skills right so um this is still a really solid um flow for a skills video um because when you're at the skills learning stage you don't know what's important you don't know why you're trying to learn so you know that you need to to right. learn you know uh how to have difficult conversations but you don't know you know why that's important you know other than you know not getting into arguments right <laughs> but uh um you know if you're if you come back to this flow um yeah adjusting it and moving it around based on the the audience and that's actually one of the one of the things i have in a later slide which is you know the delivery knowing where you're going to be delivering this thing on what platform you're delivering it on well, is a really right. critical part of that strategy. And, and one question related to that is that is yes. the uh, how do you when you talk about delivery? There's a we have a bunch of different formats of delivery. Now Lynda.com was mostly video, but there's text, there's audio, yeah. there's there's um, other things like that. How do you look at those other formats as a po potential way to and, and live like what we're doing here? How do you yeah. look at those those different formats um, and how they interrelate with learning? It kind of it comes down to that the in the slide above, which was the length and depth question. You know, how much time do you have to get into a given subject? And so, you know, there isn't an like nobody wants to sit down and watch a video, a course that's you know twenty five hours long of of stuff. But if you can get get it the subject down to like three hours and then offload some of the more heady subjects into uh, a PDF that they can download or have a, a little wiki that you build alongside the course. Like there's, and, it, and that comes down to the platform, right? What, you know, what do you have control over? For example, on YouTube, you've got the ability to chapter out things, right? Or you can build a playlist um, and, you know, there's, there's different ways you can do it. And so you have to ask the question, um, you know, how much of this are people going to l legitimately be able to consume on video? And then, um, decide what you want to offload. And that's really um, working with the instructor um, during the strategy process. You solve all those questions in the strategy before you get to the pre-production phase, before you get to writing the course and writing it out, you've kind of decided ahead of time how um, uh, deep to go and then what, you know, what's going to get left out, what's going to get left on the table. And then you can look at that pile of stuff left on the table and say, okay, this is a good candidate for a follow on course, or this is a good candidate for um, uh, an extra uh, PDF that gets downloaded alongside of it. Like, again, you have to, you, you sort of ask those questions during the strategy phase. That's awesome. Because even in, the, in just based off of what you shared, Ken in the comments says, begin with the end in mind. And that's what you said in building out that strategy, clean out yep. and pulling that all together. Let's go to John and then we'll get into our community's questions. Rob, I see a bright and shiny PC behind you. Are you a PC or a Mac guy? Uh, I am a, I'm now a PC guy and um, I started off as a Mac guy back in the day and uh, was a hardcore Mac fanboy for a long, long time. And then, you know, as I got deeper into the 3D world, I had to, I had no choice really, but to get deeper into the PC world. And uh, the monster I built behind me is my the latest creation. I built that last year. It's a Ryzen 9 with uh, uh, 128 gigs of RAM and multiple M2 drives. And um, there's uh, two 3080 cards in there, and uh, which were <laughs> almost immediately eclipsed by one 4070. <laughs> So now you need a Mac. Now you need a Mac Studio, and you'll be back to yes. the back. And we'll yeah, get you on Keynote instead of Google Slides. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. 
Yeah. Right. So yeah, I'm a, I'm, I kind of float around though. I'm a, I have an Android phone and I have an iPad pro. All right, Bill, let's get into these questions and then Rob will get back to um, the, the steps in the presentation. Absolutely. Our first one comes from Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana. And Roscoe says, do you teach checklists in your courses? How did they help the students? Might they be too limiting for learning creative processes or are they the best used only for basic concepts? Hi, Roscoe. Um, the, you know, so uh, I, I'm, I think I understand what you mean by teaching checklists. So, uh, for example, if you're teaching someone how to um, uh, mask something in Photoshop, right, you have to um, have, you know, step one is open your image. Step two is to, uh, you know, uh, get out the magic wand tool. Step three, like on and on and on. The short answer is, um, yes, you can teach that way, but a better way to teach would be to teach them um, how the mass tool works and and how to apply it in different situations. And early in the early on in in the the online video education journey, we did do a lot of that where we were teaching because we found that the audiences really needed to be handheld a lot more um, as technology has become more democratized and spread throughout society. And um, people have become more generally educated about how computers work. We've had to, we're, we're able to skip a lot of that stuff. And, you know, talking like Alex's comment before about reordering the information, we found that we didn't need to include lots of those kinds of steps in courses anymore because people already knew, you know, when we first started with uh, Linda, uh, when Linda first started, especially, um, like she had to teach people how to, to look for things on their computer. So when you taught, told them they needed to open a file, how do you do that? You know, that, that was a thing that a lot, a lot of people knew how to do. Now it's just, there's all this accepted knowledge that you can, you can, um, uh, you, you know, have in the course and, and not have to worry about including. So the, sorry, that's a, that was really long winded way of saying, you know, checklists are okay. If you're trying to teach someone to get a specific ro- result, like a, a fluid simulation, and you have to put in the exact same numbers to get the exact same result out on the other side. But, you know, that's, those are, those are, you have to really kind of know the material that you're, you're teaching and what it is you're trying to teach someone, whether or not you need to have those exact numbers and, and steps uh, included. Next question. Next one comes to us from John Snyder in Reno, Nevada. Corporate training is a multi-billion dollar industry with little evidence showing its effectiveness. Different sources argue different amounts of return. What are your suggestions to demonstrate ROI in your training projects? Um, man, that is a that is a multi-billion dollar question, actually. Um, <laughs> the you know, the one of the challenges of any education is um, it's a, a two-way street. Uh, you have to have uh, a quality education. You also have someone you have to have someone wanting to learn the thing that's being taught, right? Um, you can't force feed anybody anything. And uh, one of the the best ways to create uh, uh, that two-way street is to build an organization with learning at its core, where people actually value the process of learning. And so. Um, I mean, one of the, my my recommendation is to if there's any CEOs out here, or any people that have interactions with CEOs, uh, which is to make sure that they are building an organization that has acquiring and utilizing new information as part of their corporate culture, um, because otherwise the the training won't work. Um, you can have the most amazing training in the world, but if the people don't, uh, uh, if the the employees don't care about learning that subject, then you know, the, it doesn't really matter how amazing the training is. Bill? I agree 100% that sometimes it's very difficult. Sometimes you get lucky and it is easy. For example, I remember doing a long series of safety training for a corporation, and we could look over the course of the following two years and look at the number of incidents, the number of tickets that were written up for somebody getting hurt on the job. And if there is an obvious difference between before you uh, deployed the training and afterwards, you're in good shape. Not all projects work like that, but sometimes you can. And when you do, for heaven's sakes, document it and make a big deal out of it. (laughs) Yes. Uh, safety videos, safety education is a really, that's, that is one where you actually can go back and document that, um, you know, uh, soft corporate soft skills, not so easy to document, right? You know, how many, um, uh, you know, videos on, um, having difficult conversations at work, like, you know, you don't, you don't really document how many difficult conversations happen each day. So it is, it's hard to do. Next question. 
Next question comes to us from Douglas Carmichael. What considerations do you take into account when creating content for non-technical disciplines like industrial or maritime workers, for example? Um, say say the, the question one more time. I want to make sure I, I Well, I he's understand. asking what you take into account when, when you're making content specifically for non-technical disciplines. And he uses uh, yes. industrial and maritime workers. So those are pretty hard skills as opposed to things. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Um, the the I, I I talked about this a little bit in the uh, top of my slide deck, which was the the tools versus skills discussion. Um, a skill is something that is part of a, a a larger tool set, and when you're teaching a skill, that's a it's kind of a foundational concept of a of a, of an industry, right? And so, for example, um, video editing. I I, I talked about that earlier. If you're teaching someone video editing, you don't need to get bogged down in software to teach someone video editing. Um, and I think that's a, a really important thing. And if if you're teaching someone communication skills, for example, you don't want to get bogged down in um, the tools of communication. And so you want to, you know, uh, take a step backwards from the subject and uh, get down to, to sort of fundamentals. For example, um, in communication, um, we, you know, as human beings, we know that eye contact, if I, if I spent the whole talk looking over here to the side, I would never make a connection with my audience, right? They, they wouldn't know that I was talking to them. Even if I said someone's name, Liberty, Hey, Liberty, you know, she doesn't know that I'm talking to her because I'm not looking at the camera. I haven't made a, a contact with it, but, you know, getting down to the fundamentals of whatever that subject is, um, is really important and not in, in stepping, uh, say, um, taking one step removed from the, the, the tools and the baggage. And, and um, that's a, a something that I actually, I just realized I kind of forgot on there. Um, jargon is a really big blocker to communication. And so if you're, if you're teaching um, uh, something, uh, a soft skill like that to, to people, um, removing as much jargon as possible from the education is really important. Acronyms and and phrases, things that we as professionals take for granted in a subject area that a person who's trying to learn it are going to get stopped by. And so that's a really like, you know, when I when we first started working at, at when we first got bought by LinkedIn, we joined this massive corporation um, that had a, a long history of of internal communication. And there were all these acronyms and things for different teams that they would toss out in meetings. And we're like, did anyone get that? Like, you know, we're like, we're all on a side channel, like trying to look up the acronyms and missing what the message was being communicated because they assumed that we knew what acronyms they were talking about. And that's the kind of stuff that I'm, I'm getting after is if you can pull those, pull out the jargon, pull out the acronyms, and and really talk to people in a language that they can easily understand, then you'll you'll bridge those gaps. So what I just heard from you, even in saying that, because um, the people in corporations that are looking for maybe trainers or to bring someone or a, a series to share internally to help their team, how then if if you're pulling the jargon out of it, how then are you able to to sell those? those programs. Does that make sense where, where I'm going with the, I the, think, I yeah, I think so. Like you want to be able to, so it, it, it's two different audiences, right? If you're, if you're selling your services to a learning and development executive, that learning ex and development executive knows jargon, you can speak the jargon with them. Um, but when you get into the classroom or you get into the to the recording situation and you're teaching now to your to your learning audience, then you can pull out. So you really have to kind of know when and where to use the jargon. And um, it become it's a you know, it very much is a tool of communication and part of your communication style to know you know who it is you're talking to and what you can say without completely losing them. Great. Next question. Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana. Up next with, do Roscoe. professional users make the best teachers and or do professional teachers make the best courses? Uh, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, maybe. <laughs> the, the, what I mean by that is um, it, it it comes down to those, um, if uh, you're on screen, like go, let me go back to those qualities of instructor. I just put up that slide again. Credibility um, does not guarantee communication skills. Um, 
the the la- the credibility is like table stakes, right? You have to have someone who knows the subject, right, in order to teach it in a in a meaningful way. The last three um, things are what will determine their success as an instructor. Um, you know, generosity um, and and being empathetic. Um, that's the those are the things. Like it it if you're a professional user and you don't have those qualities. You won't make a good training product. You just won't. It, they, it, it's again. We've all, we've all watched those, and we, and it's hard to get through. Um, if you're generous and empathetic, but you don't know how to use the software, that's not going to be any good either, right? So you have to really kind of mix those qualities together, in and uh, to to be an effective uh, instructor. Next question. Sean Snyder in Reno, Nevada. Up next, within your opinion, what is the future of large content libraries like LinkedIn Learning look like in a world where peer-generated and AI-cultivated training materials are becoming the norm? Yeah, that is a that's a that is also a multi-billion-dollar question. Um, I you know. <laughs> I don't work there anymore, so I can I can kind of say whatever I want. Um, but I also have a lot of friends in the industry. Um, the reality is is that um, um, LinkedIn Learning as a library is really targeted towards a a corporate audience now. Lynda.com when it started was focused on individual learners. Um, the individual learning audience is being the most heavily impacted by the kind of content that you're talking about in your in the question, which is that peer to peer user generated content. Um, uh, corporate L and D executives are not going to buy a subscription to um, you know TikTok. You can't you don't buy a subscription to TikTok, but you know no, they're not going to authorize people to learn um, their the skills that they need to to learn for their job on. A user generated platform like that, they're going to want to to understand what it is they're paying money for, um, for that. And so really, you're talking about two different audiences now, which is um, learning and development executives and businesses versus individual learners, individual learners are going to go to like, you know, YouTube is the largest search engine in the world, right? Because that's where people go to learn first. They don't think to go to, to um, an online site, whether, you know, no matter what online site it is, they, they go to YouTube first. And then they, if they find the answer on YouTube, then they stop and they, they keep on going. And so, um, you know, it really has changed the equation when Linda first started, YouTube wasn't a thing, right? It was, you know, the internet was barely a thing uh, when Linda first started. And um, that uh, business model has changed over time. Next question. Roscoe Jones is back from Madison. If everyone learns a bit differently, how do you design courses to meet a variety of needs? Yeah, so... Um, in a LinkedIn learning course, in, in the Linda course, we really kind of pioneered this. We're teaching for, for we, we look at two different types of learners. We have the um, linear learner is a person who's going to watch something from top to bottom. Um, and then a just-in-time learner. Uh, just-in-time learner is that person like Alex was saying, you know, they, they want to know how to use that thing in the first few seconds. Otherwise, they're clicking off. And so you have to kind of structure your content for those two use cases. A person who's um, trying to learn Photoshop because they don't know anything about Photoshop. They don't. They don't even know what the pen tool is. That's a linear learner. They need to to start at the beginning and kind of work their way through. And then a person who knows enough to be dangerous can jump around in that course and get the things that they need out of it. And that's kind of where uh, in a later slide I talk about um, delivery platform. And um, that's really critical. People need to be able to um, if you're producing a long form content you know, anything longer than, you know, 15 minutes or so, you need to have chapters in there so that people can find the subject that they need to quickly. Um, otherwise, you're going to lose them. Do you do you know what the ratio is? I'm just curious, because like, for me, I've never actually watched a whole LinkedIn learning. I in fact, I you know, all I know how to do is I just I go into Photoshop or go into cinema or go into whatever. And I to your point, I click on the thing, <laughs> like, you know, like, like yes. this is what I'm looking for. What do you know what the ratio is of people who are like just grabbing what they need out of LinkedIn? Because I've been a subscriber since almost day one. But yeah, but what are they? What's the ratio of people who just randomly access it versus people who watch from the top to the bottom? I, I don't know the specific ratio, um, but I do know that every course, um, regardless of subject, has a um, 
a curve that skews high at the beginning of the course and then a long tail at the end of the course. And completion rate um, is typically uh, low. And that's just the nature of learning in general. It's, it, you know, people get what they need out of it. They they know enough to be dangerous or they lose interest. They get distracted by life and they fall off. Um, and, you know, the the people that the other at the, the end of the tail at the end of the course are those really dedicated um, linear learners that are watching it all the way through or the piece of information that they needed was right at the end of the course. But that's a typical, a, the typical view curve, um, which, you know, is, is also probably the typical view curve for uh, a YouTube video as well, which is, you know, you get people in that first, um, you know, uh, 10, 15% of the course, and then the viewership falls off. That's why the YouTube algorithm rewards people, rewards videos that get watched all the way through because they want people to stick. You know, that's that means that it was quant content that people really wanted to see. Nigel? Yeah, I wonder whether there's a way, I've not seen it, maybe I've missed it, to identify the video that I'm watching, whether it's for linear or it's for the instant response. Because sometimes I'm linear, and sometimes yeah. I just need the instant response. And there's really no good shorthand. And it's actually quite a frustrating experience to know which I'm looking for. Yeah. In, and that's kind of, you know, um, aside from uh, having two videos for every subject in the in the table of contents, there isn't really a way to actually do that. You know, but one of the things we try to do is... Um, when, like when I'm building a table of contents with an instructor, um, is to, to think about how to break the subject up into the, the kinds of chunks that will give a, a really good linear flow and then also give people the keywords that they can scan for. So, you know, for example, coming to Photoshop, cause that's something everybody here, uh, has used, right? So, um, you are going to to break that up into um you know the uh the concepts of uh digital imaging right so you're going to have things like you know uh, what is a pixel and resolution and file formats and those kinds of things in the the first couple of chapters and then you're going to get into um a user interface for photoshop and then you're going to get into um you, you 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 can either get into different tool sets or you can get into different workflows that's one of the things that's interesting about Photoshop is that it it transcends a bunch of different industries. And so uh, a person who retouches images uh, is going to use it very different than a, um, a user interface designer is going to use it very different than a video editor. So you're going to want to structure it, you know, uh, based on how it's uh, going to be used. And so that's kind of, you know, um, Nigel, getting to your question, which is, you know, how do you know as a, a viewer, you kind of really can't unless you, the people call out, you know, in the title of the video, pen tool, how to use. And then, you know, that's one of the, the things you see in the table of contents. Then if you are a just-in-time learner, you can, that'll come up in a search result, right? Or you can be scanning through the course and go, oh, pen tool, click, and you're now into the pen tool. Next question. Next one comes to us from John Snyder in Reno again. How does someone in the production community get their feet wet with building educational materials? Oh, Rob, I think you might be. Um, okay, there we go. No, I'm here. I'm here. Sorry, that was that was me. That was my my thoughtful pause. Um, the the so the medium that you're going to be teaching in is in the the medium of communication is really important. What I mean by that is um, uh, is the subject uh, something that needs a talking head, or is the subject something that needs screen cap, or does it need both? Um, not everything needs either one of those things. And so um, if you're just getting into screen cap production, that's really easy to do, right? You know, you can capture stuff using OBS. You can capture stuff using um, uh, a Camtasia, you know, or any other, any other of a dozen programs, right? And then um, you can um, practice uh, creating tutorials about subjects that you know, and that will give you the practice to work with other subjects. Because if you can cut a meaningful video of something that you know really well, um, that teaches someone uh, something that you've spent a lot of time with, then you're probably going to be able to also um, uh, edit something in a meaningful way for someone who doesn't know that subject or or for a subject that you don't know as well. And that's kind of, you know, one of the things that um, uh, on the the editing in on the editing and post-production side of of uh, the Linda LinkedIn experience um, is that the editors 
are editing a huge range of subjects, right? They are, um, you know, incredibly talented video editors. Um, but, you know, they are, you know, a, a person who's editing a course on uh, JavaScript probably doesn't know anything about, or they might not know anything about JavaScript. Um, but they're working from a set of documents that give them all of the, the bones of that course. They have a table of contents. They have the scripts, they have um, uh, something called a storyboard, which is something that we also do in the, or they also do in the subject. I don't work there anymore. Uh, and um, that those, all of those things uh, will give you, so you're not just jumping in and trying to edit something cold or produce something cold, whether you're going to shoot it or not. You really have to, it comes back to the fundamentals of production, right? You don't just grab your camera and start shooting. You have to know what it is you're going to shoot first and you have to have uh, a script and a storyboard and like all of the the normal things that you'd have in a production, you still need in the educational process. Next question. Alexander Knight, Vancouver, back again here on the panel with, do you use a teleprompter and script for your training or do you write a rough outline of what you're going to be covering in each module and then mostly improvise? It really depends on the instructor and, and also the type of content as well. So if you're teaching, um, Business soft skills, for example, is something where the person teaching those business soft skills is most likely a writer uh, and they're used to writing out um, everything that they do. And so you're going to want to work with them. And also they may or may not be someone who's used to to working in a camera. And so they're going to want to to you're going to want in that production in pre-production process to have them write out everything they do. Um Sometimes, though, they're very experienced camera delivery people and they only need to bullet and they can just go off the top of their head for stuff. Um, and then whether or not they use a teleprompter um, in in uh, the Linda LinkedIn production process um, and they're doing when they're doing live action, everybody uses a teleprompter, um, whether they're recording it at home or whether they're coming to the studios during the COVID process. Um, our team did just a, an absolutely amazing uh, amount of work to spec out a uh, what what they called the home recording kit um, that was a set of Pelican cases that they could ship to someone's home and along with um, uh, videos on how to set up all the stuff in the kit and they would work with them on Zoom to find a good location in their house that would have a great backdrop and then they would set up all the stuff, sit with them on Zoom while they set all the stuff up and then kind of work with them to, to handle the, through that process. But uh, the um, uh, you know, all, all of those things, you know, whether or not you use a teleprompter, or whether or not you bullet kind of comes down to the instructor. That was a really long winded way of saying it. It depends on the instructor, it <laughs> but it depends on the subject, too. I should have just said that. No, we like the this is a nuts and bolts community. We appreciate that part. Alex, do you have a hard time when people have a different writing voice than their speaking voice? Like, do they have a hard time with teleprompters, especially because like I yeah. write completely differently than how I talk? Yes. Yeah, the 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 short answer is yes. Uh, hell yes, actually, is the short answer. Um, you know, the speaking on a teleprompter is not a natural thing to do. Uh, people you see on television make it look easy because they're practiced professionals at using a teleprompter. It is a very much an acquired skill, and some people are able to get it and and uh, and take naturally to it. And other folks need a lot of practice and handholding, and that kind of comes down to. Um, you know, like I said earlier, knowing your instructor, um, but also in building into the production process, the time for them to get comfortable with that uh, new experience of of uh, doing that and also having read throughs because, um, you know, coming back to speaking voice versus versus writing voice. Um, I, I personally, when I write, I only write and it doesn't matter if I'm writing a corporate communication or if I'm writing a blog for my uh, an article for my blog. I write in a conversational tone and a speaking tone I, because I read everything out loud. I don't want to hear anything that that is not conversational because I'm a listener. Uh, and so when I write, I write for listening. And so um, if you're working with someone who is in, in your they are a person who is not used to speaking about the subject. Um, having them read it out loud during the process will help them get to that place where they're communicating in a more natural way. Because you can hear something when you, when you read something out loud and you sound like a robot when you are reading it, it becomes really apparent that you are not communicating well. And that's the the thing you're you're watching for in that pre-production process. Next question. Gordon Lake, Los Angeles. How do you deal with training when products constantly update? 
Ugh. Yeah, that it's it is the hardest thing. Um, re- revision debt is the industry term, um, and there is a huge amount of revision debt uh, in any library, um, whether it's a personally maintained library on YouTube or um, or a library like Linda LinkedIn. And, uh, that, you know, it's, it's really, really, really hard to do. It's, it's something that, um, I can't tell you how many times we in, in, you know, there are some companies, some software companies where you have a really good relationship with them and they are very, um, good at answering, um, timeline questions about product releases. And then other companies are super secretive and they don't want anybody to know, (laughs) <laughs> and uh they are you know y- y- it's really hard to produce content in those scenarios um because you don't know when it's going to change and you you know it's oh it's it's a a really difficult thing so sorry the 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 short answer is revision debt is really difficult to manage and but you know if if you're in this if you're building a business on this it's something you have to plan for and um this is something i talked about in one of the later slides which i haven't even gotten to but the um and I, I, the slide deck will be available for anybody that wants to 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 link uh, link to it um the having a plan for rapid takedowns and changes um is really important in your delivery process whatever you're whether you're managing a library or it's individual videos for yourself or your small business, um, having a plan for rapid takedowns and changes when something goes wrong um, is is really key. Um, you know, the in the LinkedIn learning process, we've got uh, an entire team of QA professionals that are uh, uh, dedicated to making sure nothing slips through, and stuff still slips through. Like it's just it's so much content, and there's so many hours of it, and um, and something will go through whether or not it's a inappropriate website in a search result that happened to autofill like that happened once um swear words can it inadvertently get through you know it wasn't intended to be in the course but you know the video editor um missed it um you know it was something that was on set or the person was recording at home and they're like god ah, blah blah and and that makes it all the way through and out onto the air and you get a note about it from a an end user like that happens and you have to be ready to react to that quickly alex you save a lot of versions of, of like behind every, almost every step so that it's easy to get back to, or do you, do you have ways of kind of planting a, a nail into the cliff wall as you start to build training so that you can make those uh, as Sort the of. Like you don't, mm-hmm. like, um, if you're recording a really long course for, uh, for something, there just isn't enough drive space to try and have. And also like you, you have to be thoughtful of your instructor as well. Like right, what are they capable of, of, um, right you know, reliably delivering in terms of, you know, you know, you know, if you're doing a 10 hour recording session uh, on something by the end of that 10 hours, everybody's brain is jello, right? And you can't, you can't go back and and do that stuff. And so um, what you try and do is um, uh, that's where that, you know, on that list of things that instructors should be good at, uh, or it makes them reliable instructors is easy to work with. Because when you call and say, hey, we found something in your course, can you help us fix it and get a pickup? Um, and all we need is you to say these five words and it takes them four weeks to get you that, then that's not a reliable instructor. If they go, oh, hey, Rob, here you go. Boom. And they send it back to you right away. Man, that's a that's an amazing instructor to work with. That's awesome. And I know we still have lots of questions, but I think you said you might be hopping into after hours else. We have to have you back to finish this conversation. Let's go with this last question. Alexander Knight gets the final slot here with Van, uh, from Vancouver, British Columbia. Once a rough cut is put together, do you ever get a second opinion on a training video before putting it out into the world? How do you handle critique and feedback for future iterations? Yeah, that that's especially critical when you're teaching incredibly technical subjects. Um, you don't you know you don't normally need to do it for. Um, for soft skills and things, unless you're teaching something that's like, you know, that potentially politically sensitive. Um, but if you're teaching something really specific, like, um, you know, Java, come back to JavaScript. If you're teaching a course on JavaScript, um, you want to make sure that the code that is used in the JavaScript course adds up to the correct result and that it's a, a proper technique. You know, a lot of times, you know, and this is, this goes true across every industry, right? You know, uh, a, uh, people do things that aren't necessarily 
industry standard that work. And so you have to to say out loud, um, is this something the instructor did that's unique to them? Or is this something that everybody either can or should be doing? And then you can have uh, a, someone who's not the instructor go back and watch that. Someone who's a technical expert who's not the instructor go back and watch that. Rob, thank you so much. This is a point where we want to give you the, the last word and thank you. We will share with our producers your deck so that they can go through it. What is like the, the, the cherry on top of a great conversation and presentation about learning and the content creation process behind it that you'd like to leave with us? I, I think the, the most important thing is that there is no secret sauce. Um, the only secret sauce is that you have to honor the the rules of production and stick to those rules of production throughout every be really consistent with those rules of production you have to know who you're talking to you have to um uh understand your audience um you have to uh, understand the talent you're working with like you have to 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 have a good script like on and on and on if you're really consistent with all of those steps then you can build a really consistent business if you skimp on any of that stuff then yeah, you're kind of, you, you know, you might get some good results, but you won't be consistent with it. Thank you again, Rob. Like the chat is on fire. Chris, uh, Dr. Clark says, great guests, so much packed into a, a single hour. And again, we will definitely have to have you back on and we'll share your links with the community. And tomorrow, everyone, producers, Tuesday, we're talking about NAB graphics. So some of the graphics that will be used during the broadcast are our special office hours coverage. And then also we have gone, let's see, the Taluk Traversal, 84,506 miles, 135 thousand kilometers 998 sorry kilometers that is more than 669 million bananas that's 3.4 times around the earth producers thank you for your phenomenal questions panelists for your insights and of course our back-end production team for without which we could not do this each and every day and if you want to learn more about the schedule head over to office hours Dot global Rob, thank you again. Thank you, Liberty. Sorry, I was uh, zooming. I was doing the Zoom mute thing, but uh, I really appreciate the time. And uh, I can stick around for the uh, the after hours. And uh, anybody, I'm active on LinkedIn. Hit me up there. Awesome. So this is the part oh. where we start. Warm our talking. <laughs> I think we're going to give up on this, the whisper, the whisper room. So, the, 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 Rob, we're here every, we're here every day. You could just come and visit like once a week and just like answer questions. I'm just saying, no pressure. But you can whisper the whisper room. They did learning now with AI. <laughs> when are they going to do the whole course with ChatGPT? <laughs> oh, I would pay to see the beta of that. <laughs> <laughs>